I have to disagree right off the bat. It doesn't have its roots back to a saint named Valentine. It doesn't have its roots back to a pagan festival. It has its roots back before we even knew time existed and God chose to love us. So today is a day that the world is looking for people to love them. And many people don't have anyone to love them. It's a day of sorrow and stuff as well. I looked over though and I saw when it mentioned the birds mating season, I saw Chuck went chirp, chirp, chirp. <laughs> it's good to see that he loves his wife. And we should love one another as Christ loved us. But that's, it's a four-letter word. you realize that? It's one of those four-letter words. To some, it means everything. To some, it doesn't mean much at all. And to others, it hurts. Because like I said, they don't have anyone to love them. Or the ones that they expected to love them don't love them or don't show that love. You can say the words all day long, but your actions speak much, much louder than your words. Love is what we need in our relationships. It's the reason that God chose to love us. It's not just for that special someone. It's for our children. It's for our brothers and sisters. It's for our church family. It's for all mankind. Not because any works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His love, He loved us. There was a song made famous by Dionne Warwick. It says, What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little of. Well, she's got it figured out too, but we don't celebrate it with just Valentine's Day. We celebrate it by showing God's love. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not just for some, but for everyone. Sounds pretty good so far, doesn't it? Lord, we don't need another mountain. There are mountains and hillsides enough to climb. There are oceans and rivers enough to cross, enough to last till the end of time. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's too little of. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not just for some, but for everyone. Lord, we don't need another meadow. There are cornfields and wheat fields enough to grow. There are sunbeams and moonbeams moon enough to shine. Oh, listen, Lord, if you want to know. Like he doesn't know. Come on. He is the author of love. He knows we don't need another mountain or a meadow. He need, knows that we need love. That's why he passionately pursued mankind throughout history. That's why this is God's love story. You can read it cover to cover and see the Father's love, and that was made manifest in Jesus Christ, His Son. He sent His only Son to die for our sins. That's how much God loves us. Dionne Warwick might have had some sense in that song, but then she just totally lost it when she said, Lord, if you want to know. He knows, and He's been telling us every second of every day that we've existed, I love you, my child. And that's why it is so great to see the love of an adopted child realize that and say, wow, He chose to love me. I did nothing, but God chose to love me. In fact, I deserve the opposite, but God chose to love me. If you go back to Genesis, you'll see that God loved mankind. He created the world for Him to enjoy. Everything was perfect, and then He said, I'm going to make it even better. I'm going to give you a mate. God is all about love. Then He gave us the blessings of children. Even though we sinned against Him, He gave us His Son. We deserve death, but instead He gave us love, which leads to everlasting life. What the world needs now is love, sweet love, and it is for everyone. Don't forget that. It is for the lowest of the lows, the highest of the highest, because it's not because of anything that they've done, but because of God's love. Today is a day when we celebrate love. Valentine's Day, if you didn't know it. Today is a day that we can celebrate love by doing something about those who are slaved and those who are oppressed. That's the only way we're going to cure these afflictions of this world. Because like the article that I read earlier, the problem is sin. It's us not having a right relationship with God. And even for us who do have a right relationship with God, many times, as Paulie said, we don't act like it, do we? We don't love like that. Shame on us. And it is daily, because you get up every day and you're like, oh, I don't want to face this person or that person. But Jesus Christ faced everything on the cross so that we could have victory. There's another song. This is by the Beatles. It's called Love, Love, Love. Know it? You can sing it. You can't sing it? Love, 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 love. There's nothing you can, 
do that can't be done. Nothing you can sing that can't be sung. Nothing you can say, but you can learn how to play the game. Really? I don't think love's a game. It has serious consequences. And people can be hurt, devastated. And we're supposed to be known by our love. So what happens when we don't show love? What is that person feeling from someone who's supposed to be like Christ? Some who was, someone who was saved and adopted, but yet doesn't show love. Then it goes on to say, it's easy. There's nothing you can make that can't be made. No one, can save, no, no one you can save that can't be saved. Nothing you can do, but you can learn to, to, be, learn to be you in time. It's easy. All you need is love. All you need is love. All you need is love, love. Love is all you need. So the Beatles sang about it also, but it's not easy. It's a choice to make. Ask anyone who's ever been married. It's a choice. It's not easy. Maybe that's why so many marriages fail today. Maybe that's why half of the people that get married wind up in divorce. They think, it, think it's easy. You know, people now take out those things out of their vows because they don't want for sickness and in health. I'll stay with you as long as things are good, as long as you're making me feel good, but I don't want sickness and health. I don't want till death do us part. I want what's good for me. That means I want my will more than yours, God. That I'm not concerned about how much you love me. I'll take it as long as it's easy. But when it's hard, count me out. Is that the kind of follower Jesus is looking for? We see that in our Bible studies. Jesus says plainly to those. He said, if anyone wants to, if they choose to follow me, if they want to be my disciple... And then he lays it on the line, what that means. He gave up everything so that we would understand God's love and so that we would be saved from an eternity of what we do deserve and instead be adopted as a child of God. Thank goodness God's love is not contingent upon how we make Him feel, right? He chooses to love us in spite of anything that we do. He loves us. So we need to look at his example. So we go to 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, right? So we look at it and we say, if I can practice these principles of love in my marriage, in my relationship with my girlfriend, then, then maybe this relationship will last. But let's start reading first in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. It says, now you are the body of Christ. Wait a minute, he's talking to the church, isn't he? He's not talking to a married couple. He's not talking to a boyfriend and girlfriend. He's talking to us as a body of believers. And this is what he describes about love. And each one of you is part of it. Every one of you. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have the gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? No. Now eagerly desire the greater gifts, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. Seek after all these things. Want to do these things. Pray that God gives you these spiritual gifts. But then he goes on to say, If I speak in the tongues of men, one of the most prized gifts of that time, or of angels, but do not have what? Love. I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, whoa, and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. All the other gifts are worthless compared to love. Don't get me wrong, I did not say they were worthless. I said compared to love. Because love is why God created you. Love is why God gave you a spouse if you're married. Love is why God gave you children if you have children. Love is why God gave you brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, friends and family, even enemies. Because we're to love them. Because God loved us. Reading on, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, 
It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Can you say that even in your relationship with your spouse? I can't. I'll be honest. I want to strive for that, but I can't say that. Love is kind. I've been mean to my wife plenty of times, and I probably still will. But the difference is, when I act that way, God convicts me, and I need to get on my knees to Him and to my wife and let her know that I love her. And she is a princess. She is an adopted child of God. And that I'm ashamed of my behavior. Because this is to the church, not just to my spouse. So if I do that to any of you, shame on me. I need to repent and ask forgiveness to God and to forgiveness to you. This is what Paul is trying to describe about brotherly love. So how much more should our love be to our spouse and to our children? Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put, away the, way, put the ways of childhood behind me. And don't let me get started here, because I can tell you how many times I've been childish, but we'll go that, that for a different day. For now we see only a reflection in the mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part that I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Crazy. Paul was talking to us that we should love each other that way. What would happen if we practiced that? Could we change the world? <laughs> yeah, we could. We could make a difference. Anybody that came in these doors would say, I don't know what those people have, but I want to find out more about it. Those crazy people love me. And some of them even know who I am. And they still love me. And now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So if you didn't get it, Paul says again, the greatest spiritual gift is love. That means you've got to get it from God. You've got to understand it. You've got to desire it. You've got to pray for it. You've got to want it. You've got to practice it. It's not something that comes easy. And it is something that the world needs every last one. It's not a game. It's a choice. And it's hard. And it requires dying to myself daily so that I can love others more than myself. Because I'm selfish and I want what Alan wants. But it's not about me. It's about how I can love others because I understand that God loved me first. Jesus said this in Matthew 5, verse 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes His Son to, shine, to rise on the evil and good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Don't the pagans even do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Are you practicing that kind of love? Matthew starts out, he says, you have heard it said, because he's preaching to people that already know, just like we already know, and we hear it over and over again. But do we let it infect our lives? Do we let it change our lives? Do we let the Spirit empower us? He's saying, you've heard it said, but I'm going to go a step further. You've heard it said to love these people that you're not practicing anyway. I want you to go even further. I want to, you to love your enemies those who persecute you, those who want you dead. Because the only way that the gospel message is ever going to get spread to those people is through love, through obedience, through the power of the Spirit. You must love everyone, even your enemies. Luke also has an account of this story. He says, but to you who are listening. So he starts out a little differently. Instead of saying you know already, he says, are you listening or is it going to go in one ear and out the other? Do you want to listen? If you're listening, I say to you, love your enemies. He doesn't beat around the bush. He goes straight to it. 
He doesn't say love your neighbor first. He says love your enemies. You should already know that and be practicing it. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Jesus, this is some hard philosophy. This is how you want us to love? Yep. If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold from them your shirt. Give to everyone who asks, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Okay. Give to everyone who asks, and if anyone takes... Oops, sorry. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? It says it a little differently than Matthew does. What credit? What have you done any better? Even sinners love those who love them. We're supposed to be like Christ. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to have our light shine. If we're doing the exact same thing as darkness, as sinners are doing, how can our light shine? How can we be any different? And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them. He repeats himself. And lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. Matthew said, what will your reward be? Luke said, if you do love your enemies because you already know everything else, then your reward will be great. And you will be children of the Most High. Now, he's not saying you won't be a child of God if you're not, because you're saved by grace. When you believe in Jesus Christ, you're born again. You are God's child. But what he's saying is, act like it. Understand how much God loved you, and have compassion on the world around you. Even when they're your enemies. Because your love can bring them to salvation through Jesus Christ. Your reward will be great and you'll be children of the Most High because He is, a, he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Luke ended in be perfect. I mean, Matthew ended in be perfect. Luke ended in be merciful. Faith, hope, and love. If we are, we'll show mercy, won't we? If we do that, we're becoming more like the children we ought to be, more like perfection, more like Christ. When we first read the words, we're like, perfect, how can I be perfect? You can't. But through the Spirit, you can be achieving perfection so that when that day comes, you will know how to act and behave as a children, as a child of God. That's how Jesus starts off His public ministry. He says, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. It's time for you to be redeemed, to be saved, and to start acting like the adopted child that you are. The process of perfection in Christ is described in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1-8 through 8 says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in His body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. Because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. And we still do this. We still live for our own sinful desires. We want our way. We even want it in our worship. We want our style of music or our order to this or our dessert even. Wow. It's not about me. It's about serving others. It's about loving others so that they'll know Jesus Christ. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans chose to do. Wow. Living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Well, I don't do those things, so I'm okay, right? They are surprised that you do not join in their reckless wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give an account to Him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the Spirit. The end of all things is near. Therefore be alert and sober, sober mind, so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply. There's no exceptions I see here. 
And the reason is because love covers over a multitude of sin. Love is what the world needs. So it made me think of a story. And it's not your typical Valentine's Day love story. But man, is it a powerful love story. This is a real story. It's an encounter that Jesus had. It's not just a parable. It's a story of His encounter with a, per with a person. And not just a person, but a group of people. In Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 28, it says, One day Jesus was teaching. And Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. Now picture this, okay? You know that Jesus already fed the 5,000, and we know that's not 5,000, that's 5,000 men. So that could be 10, 15,000 total women and children. So He's teaching, and it says, They had come from every village of Galilee, from Judea and Jerusalem. He was preaching to a big crowd, okay? Standing room only is not the word for this. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came. We don't know who these men are because it's not important. But some men came, carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. Now, I don't even know how they got to the house because we're talking crowds. And you've got, we've been there and we've seen the city layout and stuff. That town was embedded with people everywhere. How would you get, along, get to Jesus, let alone carry an invalid to Jesus? A man who can't walk or do anything. That's impossible, isn't it? Why don't you just give up and come back another day? Find Jesus when He leaves. But this isn't what they do. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof. I said, I don't even know how they got to the house. Then they had to find a way to get up on the roof. And they lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. Now, Paul, you didn't have many distractions, but sometimes there's distractions and you get unfocused. Think about Jesus when he's sitting there and rocks and sticks are hitting him in the head. And he's trying to preach to this crowd. And everyone there needs to hear what's going on. But these four men say, my friend, his need is important. We love him. We're going to do whatever it takes to get him through this crowd. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. We're going to have to carry him. We're going to have to move people out of the way. There's going to be rude people there that tell me to get out of the way. Maybe even knock me down, anything else. Then I've got to find a way to get up on this roof because I can't get in that door. And I've got to literally shovel through the roof of this house and figure out a way to lower this man down to see Jesus. They had faith because they had love. They had hope because they had love. When Jesus saw their faith, not the man's faith, their faith, He said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Wow! They didn't come to get their sins forgiven. They came for the man to get healed. But because of their love, because of their faith, the man was saved for all eternity. His, friend, his sins were forgiven. Look at what can happen if we act on faith, out of love. They weren't expecting that. They, they may not even known that that was possible. They wanted to get the man healed of his physical ailment. They probably need to be healed of their mental illness trying to get this man through the crowd because they were nuts. But they did. They carried him there. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friends, your friend, your sins are forgiven. Then that started a controversy. The Pharisees and teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Get up and walk? They're both impossible without God. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He was able to use this as a preaching illustration, wasn't he? So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately. Not later. How many times do we hear God tugging on our heart? We might not hear the voice through the burning bush, but we know we should go do this or do that. But we say, 
I will when this is right or that's right. Or, or I'm not sure you're talking to me, Lord, give me a better sign. Immediately, he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. He was a testimony. He immediately did. And he had to carry his baggage with him. Why did Jesus have him carry the mat? So that others could see it and say, wait a minute. Aren't you the guy that couldn't walk? Yes, I am. Jesus saved me. And not only that, but he told me my sins were forgiven. That he had the power to forgive sins also, which is what the world needs, isn't it? Love from God the Father. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. Not just these men, not just this man. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. That's what your actions of love can cause, a revival. Something you never anticipated. That many people, uh, everyone as a matter of fact, praised God. But the story doesn't end there. Or maybe it does. I don't think it ends there. I like to keep reading. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his booth. Follow me. Jesus said to him, and Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. See, there are people out there in this world, and especially on a day like today, that don't think they're loved. That think God's love does not count for them because they've done this or that bad in their lifetime. Because no one else finds them lovable. So they just think they're simply unlovable. This man's name was Levi. That meant that his parents had set him aside to be a holy man. But instead, he was a tax collector, the worst of the worst for the enemy, for the Romans. This man was not savable, at least not in his own eyes. But Jesus said, yes, you are. I have the power to forgive sins. God loves you and sent me to take your place. Will you follow me? And he got up immediately and followed Jesus. Now if those aren't examples of love, then I don't know what is. If you're looking for a way to get your marriage stronger or your relationship stronger with your children, love. Love them unconditionally. Love them as God loved and gave His Son. Because what you do may make a difference. And you're being obedient. Jesus said to love even your enemies. We read that love covers a multitude of sins. We read that love is the greatest of all spiritual gifts. Love. That's what today's about. That's what every day's about. But maybe we should start practicing on a day that's known for love. Maybe we should go tell someone today that we don't really love, that we do love them. And that will require first getting on our knees and asking God's forgiveness because of our vanity, our hypocrisy. Because God loved us enough. So why in the world would we want to not love someone else? And I guarantee you most of you can think of some person if you dig that in there deep. Somebody that you struggle with. And maybe they need to hear today that you love them. And then don't forget to especially love your family. Don't forget to especially treat your, your spouse with love. Because what the world needs is love and God gave it to us. We've just got to embrace it. We've got to live like Christ. Live as He instructed. Live as He did in His actions. And we can maybe change the world. Father, we thank You so much for Your love. That You love us in spite of our sin and shame that you cover us with robes of righteousness, that we are born again if we simply believe in Jesus Christ. Father, I pray if there's anyone here today that does not know Jesus Christ, that today is a day that they experience that love. Oh, Father, you want no one to be lost. Sometimes we think that you're not here or you tarry coming back, but you just want everyone to come to you. It's a choice that they have to make. And Lord, for those that have decided to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, let them understand what those words mean, follow me. Let them understand the parameters and the consequences of that four-letter word called love. 
Help us to not be just speakers of Your Word, but to be doers only. We thank You because You first loved us. Thank You that we have the opportunity to come here and worship You. Thank You for the freedoms that we have in Christ. We thank You most of all for choosing to love us and adopting us as Your children when we choose to believe. Empower us with Your Spirit to make a difference in this world. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.